Good afternoon and welcome to the meeting of Perth and Kinross Licensing Committee. I'm Bailey Mike Williamson, the convener of the committee, and I'm joined by my vice convener, Councillor Ian McPherson. I'm also joined by other members of the committee alongside Moina McLaren, Deputy Clerk and Solicitor of the Committee, Shona Miki and David Rankin, Licensed and Enforcement Officers, and Jessica Guild, who is a clerk to the committee. Can I now ask the clerk to confirm any apologies received for this afternoon's meeting and confirm attendance of those in the chamber and online? Thank you, convener. We have apologies from Councillor Allen, Councillor Carr, Councillor Chan, and Councillor Reid. We have some members online. I'll ask them to confirm their present. Councillor Braun. Present, Jess. Bailey Brock. Present. And Councillor Robertson. Present. Thank you. All other members are present in the chambers, convener. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, could I ask if there are any declarations of interest in respect of any business on the agenda today? No. If there are no declarations of in, uh, interest, uh, can we agree the minutes of the licensing committee held on the 2nd of October 2023? Agreed. Thank you. We now turn to page nine and members uh, this application is on page nine onwards on your document pact. I will now hand over to Moina McLaren to introduce the report. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. This uh, report it relates to the taxi fare review. Um, you'll recall that in, in the last committee uh, that um, the licensing manager sort of drew it, it to the attention of the committee that this review was going to take place. Um, and as you're aware, the, the council has a statutory duty in terms of Section 17 of the Civic Government Scotland Act to review its scales for fares and other taxi related charges every 18 months. And that this, this process, it started in October uh, 2023. Um, and a report was presented to the committee on the 2nd of October whereby the committee agrees in principle to the, the following being put out for consultation to operators with meters fitted in their vehicles. And the three fare options um, were a uh, 6% increase or a 7.5% uh, increase or no increase at all. Now, there has been a consultation with the operators and they indicated that they would prefer an increase of 7.5%. As stated within this report presented to the committee on, uh, on the 2nd of October, the Taxi Federation also presented cha um, changes that they wished to the current tariff card, which the committee agreed to in principle. Again, these changes were put out for consultation with the trade and the results of the consultation are uh, presented in now section 4.5 of the report. Um, and as a result of the consultation responses, there are a number of recommendations being made in today's report in re relation to the tariff card. We, I have to point out, though, with, there's an exception uh, to the recommendation um, in paragraph 4.5, the last bullet point, which uh, relates to the yardage. Um, from in, a, in this bullet point states that a reduction in the yardage from 12% to 10%. Um, sorry, 12 pence, sorry, to tw uh, 10 pence. Um, but we're, we're asking that this is a change that, that not to be made. Um, and uh, the reason being that this would actually effectively on you know on sort of reviewing the report and after consideration of more detailed work was undertaken it was uh, discovered that by reducing the yardage from 12 to 10 percent this would effectively wipe out uh, any proposed increase in um the overall fares and this has been this point has been discussed with the chair of the the trade association and the licensing staff felt that this was not what was intended by the trade and it would add adversely impact on the sustainability of the service. And so officers are asking 
that this recommend, recommendation, and that's the final bullet point of 4.5 of the report, um, it, you know, is is omitted, uh, is removed from the report. Um, and what I would say now, if you've got any questions um, you, that you, you could ask, if you, uh, ask Shona Miki, um, who would be a I hope, best, better place to respond to them. OK, do members now have any questions for, for officers regarding this paper? But I ask a question now, uh, Sean, would it be possible to outline the, the process going forward from here on in? Yes, convener. Um, once a decision is, is made today, I am either a to increase or no changes, then we would obviously uh, outline um, the changes, if they were necessary, to all the metered operators. Uh, we would notify them by email. Um, an advert would be placed within um, the local paper for one month. Uh, looking, um, we might get representations from members of the public. Um, after the last day of uh, any submissions uh, to us, if there were any representations, um, we would uh, write to all the um, the tax association and meter operators um, to make them aware of the decision and I, we would advise that the uh, 14 days they can appeal to the traffic commission and after the 14 days if there were no representations um, from the trade then uh, the increase would take effect at, at uh, a date um, that is decided by uh, the head of legal and governance. Thank you, Shona. Moana? Yeah. The um, committee is also asked to agree if there are no, you know, once the um, the reviews goes out, go out uh, to the public and they, they're advertised, um, if there are no adverse comments or representations from the public, um, that after the advertising, the new scale will be implemented by the head of service without the need for it to come back to the committee. Okay. Are there any further questions on this report? There are no further questions. My motion is to um, move the move the proposal with option one. Agree to a 7.5% increase across the tariffs as per the results of the consultation with the trade. Also, agree to all other charges to the tariff card as per section 4.5 minus the charge in the final bullet point. Okay. Minus the final bullet point of 4.5, as outlined by Moina. And committee is also asked to agree that if there are no adverse comments or representation, representations are received after advertising, the new scale will be implemented by the head of legal and governance in due course. Do I have a second? I'll second. Are there any amendments to the motion? If there are no amendments to the motion, uh, the motion's carried.
stops and then and making sure it goes red. Right, yeah, okay, that's when it's once you're finished. OK, moving now on to paper five, the grant of a public entertainment license PE 430, um, which is uh, the Mudstock members. This application is paid on page 17 onwards in your document document pack. For this item of business, we are joined in the chamber by the applicant, Mr. Alan Govan, and the objects and objected to the application, Mr. Lydiard. We are also joined via telephone by a further objector, Mr. and Mrs. Collings. I would now like to introduce um, all the members of the uh, and officers present. Um, I will go down. Let's see, I'm joined on my right here with uh, Moina, Moina McLaren, who's the deputy clerk and solicitor to the committee. Uh, Sean Omiki and David Rankin, who are the licensing enforcement officers. Jessica Guild, who is a um, Clark to the committee, and I will introduce my vice convener, who is uh, Councillor Ian McPherson, Councillor Grant Stewart, Councillor Hugh Anderson. I'm hoping I can remember everybody's names. Councillor Ken Harvey, Councillor Helly McPherson. Okay. <laughs> Brampton. I do apologise. I knew I'd get it wrong. Okay. All right. Um, I'd like to. Advice. We're also joined online by representatives of the Safety Advisory Group, including uh, PKC, Police Scotland, Scottish Fire and Rescue, and NHS Tayside. And I do apologise, I forgot to introduce Robert Lyle. Okay. I will now hand over to Moina McLaren, who will introduce the report. I do apologise, I forgot to introduce everybody online. So uh, we have uh, Bailey Rona Brock, Bailey Brockbourne, and Bailey Willie Wilson. I do do apologise. Okay, thank you. So this is an application for a three-year public entertainment license. Uh, it, the event is Mugstock and it, it is to be held, it's proposed to be held at Strathallan Castle from the 2nd to the 5th of August 2024. You're asked to, um, to consider um, the application and, the, and any objections um, and decide whether to grant the licence uh, and also if, if you do, if there's a decision made to grant the licence, whether to uh, agree of, upon the draft conditions that are attached to the report uh, and agree that whether they be attached to any uh, any license. Um, I'd like to sort of point out that as part of the conditions, there is a requirement uh, for the completion of six management plans uh, and these have, have got to be and, and in relation to these management plans, they cover all of the, the kind of key areas for public safety. Um, and uh, these require to be completed to the satisfaction of, vari of various agencies involved by the 1st of July uh, 2024. And that is part of that is a condition that would be a condition of the of the, the license if the, if the draft conditions are accepted. Um, so that's. I would like now to invite Mr. Gowan to introduce his application and provide members with some information on the Mudstock Festival. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Um, yeah, welcome the opportunity to uh, discuss the festival. Um, Mugstock began as a festival in 2015. It ran for four years consecutively in Mugdock Country Park near Glasgow, which is where it got its name. Um, subsequent to that, we agreed uh, with Anna Roberts at Strathallan Castle that we would move to a new site. It's supposed to be a little bit of uh, a long time coming um, because uh, we were you know, first affected by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, associated restrictions. Um, we attempted um, 
to the event on last year. Um, however, we didn't achieve the ticket sales that we hoped we would. So um, we're, we're back again. And um, I think in the meantime, what's been very useful, particularly with the support of the um, uh, the SAG group and our colleagues from the, the council, we've had a, a really a, a good opportunity to have a really robust look at plans. Um, I think we found that working with Perth Council uh, has been um, has been quite challenging for us in a, I say in a good way. We've been challenged to really think through our plans. I would even say that welcome the, the objections because we found in letters of objection things that we've been able to to address and consider such as the location of septic tank uh, that wasn't something that was immediately to our attention until I read that in the in the letter of objection. So uh, we've had a lot of same thing traffic management um, given the uh, the history of the site the previous events that have ran there. Uh, traffic management was a was a, a large source of concern in the latter um, in the latter days while we were um, just still considering the event for last year. Uh, as a result of that, that's been um, been addressed really quite comprehensively. Um, grateful to um, to again colleagues from the council who have given their time and their expertise to help us pull those together. Um, and I think we've now got a sort of pretty robust set of plans that are you know, based on a, a collective effort based on. Uh, on learning from history and I think the, the main thing that's probably worth emphasising is that obviously this site has hosted uh, a very very large event in the park in the past um, that event did not go without its hiccups without uh, uh, issues and without causing um, you know, concern and justifiable concern to local residents uh, what we'd emphasise was the, the comparative scale of the event um, I think makes a lot of those concerns um, perhaps uh, some way towards being mitigated um, in that at, at its most ambitious what we're applying for the license for 5,000 people um, in comparison to at its peak of 75 or 85,000 capacity licenses to the park had in 2016, 2015. That being said we actually I imagine this is over three years we expect to hit that target and we expect it's much more likely that we're looking at around 3,000 people on site uh, next August. Um, and uh, I think we would just encourage the committee to consider the comparative impact that has on traffic, on noise, on all of the um, the reasonable concerns that would come up uh, surrounding a, an event of this nature. The event itself is aimed primarily at a audience of music lovers and families, and ideally yeah, families who are music lovers. Um, we have a, a track record. I mean, it's proven in our statistics and stuff, but our audience uh, every year, without approximately a third of our entire audience have been 12 or under. Uh, we, we get a very, very family uh, audience. We a very different audience. I think when, when we did, uh, I personally knocked on uh, all of about 98 doors um, in the in the local area, and I, I, we did meet with a lot of, um, I would say, completely justified and rational concern or suspicion what is this is this coming is this going to be similar to a previous event on site um, and I think when I was able to explain a the comparative size and b the comparative audience and demographic that we we're going for um, Mugstock does not allow uh, under 18s to attend uh, unaccompanied uh, which is let's say the, one of the key target markets for um, for music festivals I'm going to be completely honest we would make more money we would sell tickets easier if we if we change that policy and we allowed say 16 17 year olds to come uh, I'm, I'm sure there would be a, a demand or a market but it's not the sort of festival we're interested in putting on we want to put a festival that feels safe and feels um, like a, like a nice environment for um, for people to enjoy uh, enjoy a nice place we don't put on acts that are you know, huge in stature or likely to um, uh, attract uh, a really large team of, uh, you know, hordes of people. We focus on emerging acts um, and smaller independent music. We're, we're really interested in, in just the, the sort of undiscovered um, musical talent that is out there. Uh, I, I think that's probably kind of enough on the general, um, the, the general festival. I would um, just to uh, finish by saying Mugstot is a registered charity. It's run as a non-profit event. It's volunteer led. I'm a volunteer myself and uh, and that's the spirit of it. We're, we're here to try and uh, um, celebrate human talent and potential, uh, do it in a nice place and do it ha hopefully um, while having um, you know, the, the most limited sort of impact that we could possibly have um, on, on anyone concerned.
Thank you, Mr. Govan. Um, do members have any questions for Mr. Govan? OK, I'll start with uh, Ellie and then move on to Ken. Hello, you never mentioned anything about security around the, the camp. Could you tell me what you've got organised for that? Uh, yeah, of course, so we've um, we've been working with a company called Anubis Security. They're a very large established firm. Um, they, you know, they they do events up to sort of 80,000 capacity. Um, this, um, you know, the, the, this represents something very normal for them. One of the things that attracts them about it is they've been doing lots of different events of different nature and they really like the idea that this is going to be a, a family event. They think that a lot of their staff will be, will be, will be sort of um, fighting to try and get those shifts. Um, the security provision has been discussed um, in, in depth with uh, with Police Scotland. There was a meeting I wasn't able to attend, but um, say our head of security and uh, representative for Police Scotland, I believe maybe on the um, on the line. Um, I met on Tuesday uh, to to discuss. Um, I believe that there are thirty eight defined security positions that would be uh, manned by by SIA. Um, or uh, stewards, uh, as in the vast majority being uh, SIA. Uh, this includes uh, response teams, uh, supervisors of backstage areas, campsite patrols, um, and I'll say ent entry um, searches, search positions, um, and uh, um, looking after the extremities of the site, the gates as well. So it's a it's a very very robust um, and thorough security plan uh, with a, a very experienced. Um, and reputable security contractor. Um, the total cost of it is around about £35,000 that we're spending on security uh, directly. Uh, and to give a comparison, uh, when we put the event last time on in 2018 Multi Country Park, we spent approximately £6,500. So it has been, um, and the scale of the event has not increased uh, in that proportion. I think you'll, you'll um, agree that we have put in a, you know, a very comprehensive plan. And it is, it is obviously there in the uh, Within the the documents for for review, and I'm happy to to send anyone any other details or uh, or point them to uh, tables and charts, etc. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, you answer. I had two questions, but I've just noticed one of them. The camping attendance is three three thousand. Is that still the the case at the moment? Yeah, I mean, that would be the absolute maximum. We're going to prov uh, provision for that. Um, I think it's much more likely that there'll be something between a thousand to a thousand and a half people will choose to camp on site. Uh, the camping is a, there's a mixture of options. So there's a general camping, there's a families campsite, there's a, we'll call it a quieter campsite, uh, accessible camping, uh, and a live in vehicles area as well, and a glamping site as well. Second question, if if possible as well. Yeah, I'm quite. I've been to a few festivals. I'm quite aware. You described your festival as being for music lovers and families. Is it going to be similar in kind of tone to the other Mugduck festivals in the past? I've never been to them, but I know the kind of bands that play. Yeah, exactly. And um, the, that's the um, you know, that's the. I mean, we I suppose we're not really defined by a sort of one in, and one particular music genre. We're not like a rock festival or jazz festival. Um, the people can expect to find a real variety of music. Uh, and that they'll say the main thing that maybe uh, links the most of the acts is probably that they're unsigned or they're not you know, large commercial acts. Uh, and again, that has an impact on who attends, because I think a lot of the, the festivals where maybe issues occur, people are drawn in, first of all, by, you know, by a popular name and uh, um, whereas actually to 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 come into the most as a you know as an event to commit to it is probably something more about the community aspect of it that appeals and I think that um, that has led to the, the the feedback we have the word safe has come up so often um, the atmosphere um, and uh, and and a lot of people just say you know, that it, they used to go perhaps to an event like tea in the park when they were younger and now they have grown up and now they've got children they wouldn't go to maybe a, a similar event, but they love the idea that they could go to something like Mugstock. So we get a lot of people that have either not been to a festival for a long time or they've never been to a festival. We get a lot of first time festival goers, so ease in. OK, thanks. Councillor Anderson, followed by Councillor Brock. Conditions are such, there's the one objected does comment on it as such. On dogs, position of dogs, there's very little said on your side about dogs. The time of the festival, it's August, beginning of August, which is 
<laughs> I don't know what we hope for Scottish weather at that time, but the, the cars been dogs been left in cars or whatever units they're camping in. Um, also, dangerous dogs. There's no mention of what type of dogs might be banned from entry to the festival because there's a kind of growing list of dogs that are not that welcome or dangerous to other people, especially children. There's no provision made for in your conditions anyway on that side. Could you explain? Yes, certainly. And there's there's more. I mean, on our website www.mugstock.org forward slash dogs, uh, it outlines this much more comprehensively than I'll be able to do from memory. But um, our policy on dogs, we um, uh, being very conservative, we didn't allow dogs the very first year that we ran at Mugdock Country Park, um, and that was kind of interesting because that actually Mugdock Country Park is primarily used by dog walkers to walk dogs. Um, the second from from 2016 to 2018, we allowed dogs every year. Um, we we didn't have any incidents when we moved to this site because it's arable land. Because there um, you know there there are um, there's maybe more more reasons to um, to be cautious. We uh, had quite a you know, lengthy discussion about, uh, about this, and it resulted in um, in this policy. So the policies we have are selling dog tickets. So we're not expecting people to simply just come come with their dog. They have to register uh, in advance. They have to send the like, dog's name, dog's breed, um, and colour, etc. And they they'll be registered when they come in. The dog will have a you know some sort of um, thing on the collar with a phone number attached to it. But that should never be you know, required because um, dogs strictly must be kept on a lead at all times. Um, the, this will be um, reinforced by security, by all our, our own, everyone across our full team. Um, anyone that is seen, and, and people have to sign a disclaimer to, to agree to this if they're bringing their dog. Anyone who, either the dog uh, causes an incident, the dog must be removed from sight. Um, if, if someone doesn't clean up after their dog, the dog is removed from site and the owner is removed from site and they will not be allowed re-entry. Uh, and and we, we've said this will be 100% strict on it because it's um, it, it's it's an easy behaviour uh, for for respectable mature humans to uh, to fulfil and we expect them to. Uh, I, I, of course, people will want to exercise their dogs, so we're building a dog run uh, and we've got, a, again, a detailed system of how that will be managed um, to ensure that that whoever uh, certainly essentially books a, 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 a slot in that can choose whether or not to allow other dogs in with their dog, but it is their choice as the sort of controller of that space. And there will also be additional stewards around uh, as well to uh, to supervise. But um, so there'll be an option for people to exercise their dogs. Therefore, they shouldn't be in a temptation to let them off the lead at other times. If they do, if they're seen to do, the dog uh, will be removed from the site. Uh, that. That's kind of roughly our uh, our approach. It is um, synonymous with the, that that taken by other festivals that allow dogs, um, and I think a lot of the sort of maybe target market of those that, that may be going to uh, likely to attend are used to you know to these policies at events such as the uh, Nokongorok Festival, um, who have, have been you know ma managed to run as a, a a festival that welcomes dogs for uh, for twenty years now. Back that just a little bit because there are certain types of dogs maybe have to be muzzled when they're on site or out. Um, will that be part of the regulations? Dogs that are looked at when they're wandering about the site, they've got to have a muzzle on them, whatever. I mean, we would be happy to, um, you know, to take advice and to consider further whether we need to update anything within that policy. Um, we tend to, um, to you know, veer towards a, a policy of individual responsibility with careful monitoring and supervision. Um, I think it, it would be a maybe perhaps an ar arbitrary position for us to take to say one particular breed of dog may not come. Uh, I think if uh, if if you, for example, if you would take your dogs to the park and you would, as a matter of course, because of that dogs have a muzzle on them, then you would put a muzzle on them if you were taking them to um, to the festival. Uh, I think it, it does need to be maybe um, it's a little bit more nuanced than to be able to uh, to be very categorical about it. But I, know, I think it's a it's a it's a reasonable point that you you make. Rona, can you hear us? 
I can hear you now, yes. Can you come okay. with your question, please? Yep, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, mine says more about the transportation side of it. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. Now, you're saying 3000 and the camping, is that? I take it that's over the course of the, the event. But how many do you envisage? Is it going to be on a daily basis or are these going to be camping over the period of the event? Or is it going to be individual different times of when campers are going to come in to the site? There is a, a one night camping option. Um, in the past, we found it's maybe been a one percent or something that perhaps I uh, opted for that. Um, most, if mostly people um, choose to camp, they will choose to camp for either the full weekend or at least a couple of nights. Um, some people, maybe uh, especially if you're uh, with a family, depending on the weather, uh, was probably dependent on whether people stay that extra night. Uh, it is within the school holidays, so we, we anticipate and hope that people will stay um, right through from the Friday night to uh, to the Monday morning. Um, but there will be some, you know, a, a degree of coming and going. Some some may arrive on Saturday, some may leave on Sunday. Um, the but to say that the majority of those that choose to camp probably they're arriving once and they're pitching up and they're going back and um, we we have asked everyone uh, as they've been buying tickets uh, obviously we, we've now refunded most of the tickets from last time but it, but we, we got quite a good picture from from having done that exercise and asking last year what times people expected to arrive so that all went into our traffic management plan we did quite a lot of detailed data modeling about um we can show you all sorts of colourful spreadsheets that show predicted arrival times and traffic flow rates, etc., based on when people have said that they are they are likely to come. Um, what we were pleased to see uh, at that point was that um, the the busiest arrival time um, was shown as uh, Friday afternoon uh, between uh, 1 and 3 p.m., which in terms of other traffic, rush hour, etc., we thought was quite good uh, to get, you know, get the traffic on the site before um, you know, the, the other surrounding roads perhaps get um, get busy uh, in the course of making these traffic management plans. We've spoken in, in quite a lot of depth with uh, sort of traffic management companies and the, the prevailing thought is that the, even at its peak of, of ambition for the, the uh, event, the amount of traffic that is actually going to be generated um, is not going to be you know, an abnormal amount that is likely to cause issue. Um, and therefore, the I'd say very robust traffic management plans we've put in should be seen as um, really, um, I guess, a, a, a great bonus because we're, we're, we're going over and above. And I think we're, in a sense, we're overcompensating for um, because of the the fact that there were issues surrounding traffic at a previous event. I think if we had gone into this in a completely blank slate site where uh, a, a comparable or larger event had not taken place, the onus to put in uh, these traffic management measures might not have been there to such an extent, but they are. So if that makes sense. Yeah, one of the other ones I would like to know is um, the timing for them booking in for camping and they want the times for them booking out. Is there going to be enough time in between those times um, for the traffic management round, given the area that it's in and the roads aren't the greatest? Um, you know, I'm just wondering if you've got a booking in time so that it allows ones to be off site before the other ones come in. Is that something uh, you've considered? It's that there won't be so much of a uh, there are very few times within our models of um, times when people will be both leaving and arriving at the same time. Um, I say we'll have a lot of arrivals on Friday. Um, we'll have some departures later Friday night. We'll have a lot of arrivals on Saturday. And we will have a, a, a handful of people probably leaving between Saturday morning and early Saturday afternoon. Um, more people arriving steadily throughout Saturday. Um, some people leaving on Saturday night. Um, quite a few people probably leaving on Sunday, um, but maybe not first thing, um, or like the later in the afternoon, more arrivals on Sunday. So the, there's not, and we're using a sort of one way system as people coming in one way and the other. I'm actually looking at it more from the camping site, so uh, that you've maybe got some off site before you bring others on site if they're only there for a day or two days. So you don't, you know, so you've got a gap between it, so you don't have a mix up of people coming off and people going in at the same time just to regulate it a bit more? 
Yeah, as I say, the, I'm not there talking are... about the day ones. I'm talking about yeah. your camping ones. The camping ones. Like yeah. you would be on any site if you were going camping anywhere. You can't get in until a certain time, but you must be off site by another time, just like it would be at any other camping area. Yeah. So a weekend camper can arrive anytime from 12 p.m. on Friday. Um, and they must have departed by 5 p.m. on Monday. A day camper um, can arrive from um, the, they can arrive on you know, any any time essentially on the day that their ticket is for, and they must have let, uh, depart by 2 p.m. on the, the the following day. As I say, the number that are expected to camp as a single night is is a very negligible number. It, it's a, it's a really a convenience for people that can maybe maybe they've got another commitment another day, but they'd like to do the they have the camping experience for just two, the one day. Um, it, it will be a minority. Um, there. In terms of how the camping has been planned, it's not like there's camping a set number of, of pitches and we need someone to leave before there's space for someone else to come in. There will be ample space for all. Um, so, and uh, as they, we've, we've asked people what time they, they are going to arrive or they think they're going to arrive. We're not expecting people to book in and stick to a defined time. Um, maybe if we were running an event twice the size, that might be um, you know, a, a consideration. But in terms of the, um, the, 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 the we've looked into say, considerable detail um, and uh, I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't um, imagine there would be any particular gains in terms of the uh, um, the outcome of, of how the traffic flows if we were to, uh, to adopt that in this instance. Um, but if, if you wanted to have a look at the, you know, in detail at the um, the models for how that the data has been, you know, how we've arrived at these conclusions, I would be very happy to talk uh, talk you through it. And as I say, although these plans that were referenced at the start uh, that need to be done by July, they're actually all in place and in my mind they're, they're, they're broadly complete and have been submitted already uh, and understand that we still have the opportunity to to make updates up until July so obviously there's there's perhaps opportunity there. OK, thank you. OK, Councillor Stewart. Um, I'd be interested in, in understanding where you've come from, you, met, you alluded to that your name takes it from Mugduk Country Park and you had it there for four years and I imagine you managed to get quite good at all the infrastructure and the, all the roads. What's the reason behind choosing Strathallan? The so Mugdot Country Park, well probably I should say why we were not at Mugdot Country Park anymore. Mugdot Country Park is a beautiful, a beautiful location. Uh, it's very close to Glasgow, which was attractive. Um, however, th there is very, very little in the way of uh, infrastructure in terms of parking. And there's also very little in the way of open space. So we ended up using the overflow car park of Mugdot Country Park as the main arena. And that meant there was therefore even less room for parking. So we uh, rented a field one mile away down the road from a local farmer, and that was the car park in the in the second, third, and fourth year. It also um, part it was partitioned to also include uh, live-in vehicles, and then it was partitioned further to include family camping as well. So actually, what we ended up with was a large chunk of what you would like to have as one thing was a mile away and only accessible via a shuttle bus, um, and. Uh, in terms of all the other space that we, we had at our disposal, there wasn't any room to grow further. We had applications from local businesses who we, and charities who wanted to come and exhibit and have a stall and we literally didn't have a space for them. And this was, um, and without the ability to to grow, they, would, they, they wouldn't have the ability to perhaps put on you know, a, a larger act. And I don't mean we want to put on um, Beyonce, you know, don't want to put on <laughs> some, um, you know, the slightly, slightly um, larger acts that, that uh, might not play as as regular, etc. So the the mostly the ninth percent of the reason it was down to to parking and the inability to get everything together in one space. Um, and what led us to uh, Strathallan was just a, you know, an audit. There's not a, a lot of uh, viable space in uh, uh, in Scotland where um, where an event like this has um, camping and can um, and, you know it, it isn't so remote that it's a huge huge journey for loads of people. Um, I think the fact that um, that the event had hosted, you know, say a much much larger event uh, previously. Um, suggested to us that if we were going to run uh, you know, a small 
event on this site, then uh, the the amount of space that is at our uh, our disposal um, it was really attractive. Uh, the fact that our predecessors on site in the park had done a lot of uh, infrastructure work and stuff that's not maybe your average festival goer wouldn't particularly appreciate this, but they did, did spend hundreds of thousands of pounds putting in, for example, hard standing roads, and that makes it really uh, it makes the behind the scenes aspects of the festival um, run a lot smoother. I, I've never seen a happier site manager than we took him to show the site. He was like, it was um, like a giddy schoolboy. The idea of hard standing roads and people not getting getting stuck as they as they move around the uh, the infrastructure. So the and the fact that I say we we don't need to use this sprawling huge space like in the part you every you know, square square inch that was available uh, and it got really quite close and I'm sure you'd be aware Mark, that it was close to to your property and uh, and others you know, the, the uh, obviously those concerns with the um, wildlife as well and the impacts um, and we've been able to I guess cherry pick a little bit use the um, the knowledge and the experience from from those that um, put on the site because I'm, I'm sure some of you be aware that the ex the part site manager now works on the estate, so that knowledge of how the land works and how the land can best be used is has been retained on the site, uh, which has been been very helpful. So, um, yeah, we're we're there because it's a it's a central location in Scotland, and um, we've got good land that seems to drain well, um, and um, <laughs> certainly the bits we're using, and we believe, <laughs> um, and. Uh, um, yeah, it's a it's it's a it's a beautiful location um, that uh, you know has a rich history of of things happening, including the you know the um, aviation museum that was there way back in the day, and all sorts of uh, um, fairs and things that have taken place there um, back in, in throughout its heritage. Uh, uh, Council Braun, are you there, please? You got a question? Yeah, thank, yeah thanks, Convener. Uh, very quick question, really. Um, you mentioned that um, you were looking for uh, uh, 3,000 uh, people to visit uh, and you didn't make it last year. I'm just wondering what is the what's the figure you have to have to make this a viable event to go ahead? Uh, and given last year, are you confident that you can do it this year? Yeah, a very good question. Um, the figure we need is a little bit of a sliding scale at the moment because Whilst um, we was we carried over the event, so we announced it wasn't a cancellation; it was a postponement. Um, we've uh, we asked of the acts to carry over. Not all have or been able to, or have confirmed that they're being able to. At a recent meeting, we've agreed that we're we're sticking with essentially what has carried over, what has been agreed so far, which represents about uh, fifty percent of the lineup from a budgetary perspective, and and we're. Um, as I say, well, we're a charity. We, we we need to you know be fiscally responsible as we put this on. Um, we don't have a large you know, commercial backer, so we are allowing ourselves the flexibility. And so, uh, we'll emphasise while we're applying today uh, and for this next three years for this five thousand capacity license, um, and and we've put in and all the plans are based on that and based on you know. Uh, provision that would 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 safely look after and accommodate more than five thousand people. Um, we, we do reserve the right to scale that back and we've been very transparent with our, our colleagues on the SAG and panel and licensing that we may choose to do that. And if we do we do so, um, I would presume that uh, there would be a sort of ideally devolved responsibility to the you know, officers on the SAG to agree what you know what proportional um, responses would be to that. Um, so that's why I can't give you an exact exact figure. Um, it's probably um, it's probably not less than 2000 um and uh, it's uh, yes yeah, so it's like somewhat somewhat remains to be seen where um our marketing manager completes his phd today and then is uh, is getting started and what part of that will be answering that question um in terms of the um yes of course okay I'm just bob, back. You, so yeah just no sorry, sorry no bob bob just yep. wait please um, Bob, I'm just going to bring Moiner in because I think the question okay. has got no relevance to the decision making of this council, but Moiner will explain. Yes. Yeah, the, the, the financial position um, or, or, or the sort of financial decisions is, are probably, is, probably, is not relevant to the decision um, that we'd be considering today. 
Oh, okay, Bob, do you still wish to come back in? No, that's that's fine. That's okay. I accept that. That's fine. Okay, thank you. Are there any further questions for uh, Mr. Govan? If there are no further questions for Mr. Govan. I'd like to invite Mr. Lidard to provide details of his objections. Lidard, I do applaud. Thank you, Councillor. Could I start by just saying that I think describing the deaths of five people as a minor hiccup is actually disrespectful for the families of those who lost their children. And if that is the viewpoint of somebody who wishes to run a festival at Strathallan Castle, he's already lost the point of why I'm here, which is specifically camping, overnight camping is a danger. It always was. And unfortunately, the whole process of planning permission for Tea in the Park was one that was marred by lies and deceit. But they got their permission and now we're faced again with having the prospect of a festival at Strathallan and it is not a suitable site. It never was. Um, however, as I say in my letter, I'm very happy if they wish to run it as a ticket only day festival for the enjoyment of people, then that's absolutely fine. But I just believe there should be no overnight camping. He's told us about security plans. Um, and how they're currently looking at spending £35,000, which seems quite a small sum of money. Um, I would be very interested to know what there is going to be in the way of fencing around the campsites. In fact, fencing around the entire arena site. Um, we were told by the police who were lodged with us in year one of Tea in the Park that unless you have a double fence around a, car park, a, a camping site, you may as well forget having a fence at all because it's just it just doesn't work. Um, point one. Um, <clears throat> I would like to say again at this point, um, as in my letter, I, I I found the whole process by which the notices were displayed as as one that struck me as being actually quite devious. Um, the the initial application was stuck on a, a fence post at the wrong end of a private drive. And having had a conversation, my first conversation with, with the licensing committee didn't go all that well. Um, all I wanted, I asked the question, have they applied? And I didn't, all I wanted was a yes or no answer and I didn't get it. And it wasn't actually until a friend of mine said, oh yes, I did notice there was a piece of paper stuck on a fence post about a license application that I was actually alerted to the fact that indeed an application had been made and I had to go down a private drive to find this notice. And I rang the licensing department who actually since then have been incredibly helpful and courteous and your enforcement officer then managed to get the notice where it should have been, which was at the front entrance of this event on the public road, even though even then it was set back to the point that you might not have noticed it. And then the second application for the market trading, they did exactly the same, which is failed to display it on the front entrance. I, and and, and as, I, as I said in my letter for that, I mean, I, I just found that either arrogant or stupid or both, but, but more to the point, very devious. I mean, if, if this is an upfront event, then you have no problem in telling the public that you're coming and that you, you, you know, and you display your notices prominently so everybody can have an informed decision. I noticed in one newspaper report, it says there were only two objections. We had the same thing in Tin Park. There were only seven objections. But friends of ours have said, oh, we didn't even know there was a concert coming. We didn't know a license had been applied for. So uh, <laughs> um, that. That side of it, I, I have no idea why they, they, they couldn't be sort of upfront. Um, this whole business of selling tickets before you've got a license. I mean, how does that work? Surely the first thing, if you're, if you're intending on running an event, and again, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm very happy for them to have this day event, but you get your permissions first and then you sell tickets. Otherwise, here we are, you know, they're already selling tickets for next year and they haven't as yet been given permission by yourselves. 
to me, that's bizarre. If I was going to run a business, I would make sure that I have all of that in place first. Then I would approach my ticket buying public. Um, the problem of drugs, uh, uh, again, my letter pretty much says it all, but um, sadly, uh, again, the demographic that we're talking about, I think it's fair to say that it's actually um, the affluent middle classes who uh, are now driving the entire drug trade in this country rather than the youngsters, although the youngsters are now finding them so cheap that actually they're a much they're a viable alternative to alcohol, which, as we've been told, they're, they're not drinking anymore. Um, dogs. Um, sorry, Councillor Anson meant mentioning dogs. Uh, uh, my belief is that allowing people to bring dogs is is merely a, a way of generating ticket sales without actually looking at you know what potentially are the, the the serious dangers of having dogs in an event like this and you know if you're talking up to 5000 people you could be talking over a thousand 2000 dogs I, I have no idea but um as we know i mean in in recent years um people being attacked by dogs dog fighting has massively increased um I'm very rightfully saying, you know, if people are caught not picking up their dog's defecations, they will be removed from sight. But how on earth do you police that when you've got all those people running around and you've got children who are also running around? And, and I don't like to go into the details of children crawling around where dogs have defecated. Um, are they providing on-site vets? because if there is a dog fight, you're going to need a vet. And our experience of the local vets is they are so busy, you sometimes have to wait for a week to see a vet. It's not an emergency service like the medical service. Um, so I would very much, again, I would ask that no dogs would be allowed on site. Um, this, is, this is an area where nothing happens all year. It is quiet, it is full of wildlife, and they are saying, all of a sudden, 5,000 people, a whole lot of dogs are going to arrive. It is almost inevitable that some dogs will escape and then we'll be running around. Um, <laughs> you know, it, I think it's I think it's probably wishful to think otherwise. But um, and and again, as I say in my. Um, my letter, um, there are signs all over the estate saying snares set, keep your dog on a lead. Well, as I pointed out, if, um, it would be sad if one of those dogs ended up being throttled. Um, no mention of the water courses. There's a huge lake next to the arena site. Is that going to be fenced off? Yes. And all the burns? Good. Because this is August. If it's hot and people see water, they will go into it. Um, and even if it's fenced, I wouldn't necessarily say that it's not going to happen, but I would hope that some kind of rescue element is in place so that if somebody does get into the water and gets into difficulty, you can fish them out before they drown. Um, obviously, fire, there will be conversations with the fire services because there's a lot of woodland. And again, if it is very, very dry, that also is a difficulty. I mean, in, um, medical facilities, um, is there going to be a medical hub on the site or are you just expecting the local doctors to? Sorry. OK, no, OK. OK, I... no, fine, I apologize. Um, well, I will say what, what kind of medical provisions are being provided, you know, as again in my letter, it said over 500 people needed medical medical attention at tea in the park. Um, are they just expecting to be able to ring 999 and get them lifted to PRI or nine wells, or, or will there be some form of medical center on site where people can get treatment for for whatever? I mean, you know, um, water supply, toilet facilities. Um, Again, I sadly had to go into some detail about the, the adequate toilet facilities. Um, what, what perhaps um, we could be told what the ratio of toilets to prospective festival goers will be. 
because sadly at Tierna Park they were completely inadequate um, and unfortunately your own Mr Dixon was not prepared to actually do anything about that. Um, if it rains and I think it's fair to say that if they'd gone ahead this year it would have been a disaster. Um, what, what measures are going to be put in place for the protection of the watercourses and the enormous amount of silt that potentially could enter them as it did with Tierna Park. It took, as I said, probably about three years for the burns to clear after Tierna Park. We had SEPA actually showing us bags of evidence saying we've got enough here for prosecution. No prosecution was ever followed, but it just proved that without adequate protection, the watercourses are seriously in danger. Um, I would point out that um, the clues in the name, their car park are, is due to be on fields called claylands. I don't think anybody is any doubt what happens to clay when it rains. Um, so um, either I hope they have a lot of tracking in place just in case it does rain, otherwise getting cars in and out might be a bit of a problem. Um, litter, can we, can, um, again, assurances are always given that, um, that the site will be cleared properly at the end of the event, etc, etc. If you walk around the fields at Strathalla now, you will still see litter from tea in the park. Seven years later, drink tins, trainers, toothbrushes, body wipes, they're still there. Um, this was a pristine environment before tea in the park. Um, Maybe the view now is that it, it's ruined, so carry on ruining it. Um, wildlife, obviously. Um, again, as I say in my letter, um, we all know about the osprey at Tea in the Park and um, the attempts to get rid of it um, by parking the cherry picker under the nest to try and prevent the osprey from returning. Um, Ospreys have other ideas. But unfortunately, post here in the park, that nest was abandoned. But there is now a new nest, and it is about the same distance from the arena as the old nest. Now, again, as I say in my letter, the original position was that you had a 750 metre exclusion zone around an active nest. The Scottish Government forced Scottish Natural Heritage to change that distance to 150 metres. What I don't know is whether that was a specific 150 metres for Tierna Park or whether that now stands as law for all grade one protected European species in Scotland, you can now approach a nest to within a distance of 150 metres without prosecution because there is legal precedent. Um, obviously, at this point in time, we don't know whether that osprey will come back or indeed whether the estate will cut the tree down over the winter months when the osprey is not in residence, which is the intention they had for the original nest. Um, unfortunately, they didn't own the tree in which it was nesting. Um, and apropos that, uh, activity out with the site and any kind of attempt for fireworks or bright lights at night. Uh, I mean, I again, devil's in the detail, I have no idea what time they are estimating. They're saying they're going to stop at night. I mean, there's a lot of detail I don't have. This is purely on, on, on my past experience. Um, and, and obviously insurance, um, returning to the dog situation, should dog owners prove that they have valid insurance, third party insurance for their dogs before, if, if you are going to allow dogs on site, then it would seem reasonable that every dog owner should have third party insurance in, in place for their dog, just in case it does bite a child or attack another dog and incur costs. Um, and as I say, if they if they don't feel they can provide adequate insurance, then, then maybe um, the estate should also have insurance just in case. And at least people do have a second course of redress. Um, I would also point out that um, when it comes to um, 16, uh, under 18s, um, have to be accompanied by an, an adult. It would have been quite useful if on their own posters they actually pointed out where they say youths 13, 17, 20, 60 pounds must be accompanied by an adult 
because that is actually giving false information to potential ticket buyers. Now, obviously, when you go to buy the ticket, it may be that you are not allowed to buy the ticket unless you have an adult's permission. But uh, again, sadly, in the world in which we live, um, how do they plan to check age, et cetera, et cetera? Um, they're going to be busy with everything else. I, 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 I have no idea. Um, and one last thing, I, you, you know, I'm, I'm, I appreciate the fact they're a charity and that they're, you know, and the money is tight. Um, that um, probably means that a lot of volunteers will be involved. Um, our experience of volunteers at Tea in the Park was when they get bored, they leave and go and do what they want to do because they think they've done enough. Um, and that might leave certain elements somewhat vulnerable. Um, I just put that in. Um, I, I suppose only one other thing, I mean, you know, apropos the wildlife and, and the fact that this is a fight where nature carries on. Um, person can his own policy on environment says particular regard should be had to developments where people may be unfamiliar with their surroundings and leisure and recreational developments which may result in a large number of people congregating in one place. This identifies that the council will seek to safeguard the long-term diversity and sustainability of species and natural habitats in Perth and Kinross. Um, I would hope that you would put that in your thinking when it comes to a large influx of people into a, a, an area that otherwise is about as quiet as a church mass. Thank you for listening to me. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Lee. You've made a number, you've raised a number of points. So what I will do is I'll listen to the other objectives first, and then I'll bring in people who may be able to respond to some of the points you have raised and maybe possibly address your concerns. Okay. Um, do members have any questions for Mr. Lydiard? Okay, Councillor McPherson. Oh, uh, thank you, Mr. Lydiard. Um, it's just a point of clarification, really, uh, uh, from your letter. You say, um, if, if, if I've interpreted this right, that if the organisers could run it purely as a day ticket only festival, um, that you would have no objections to to the 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 event going forward. So the only issue is that you, you you would approve of the festival provided they took the camping component out of the out of the provision. Is that right? I would certainly be prepared to give them the benefit of the doubt. And as long as that was on a one year license and they can it, at least it gives them the opportunity to prove that they are a thoroughly upfront and competent organisation. From there, then they can come back and, and seek more a, a license the following year. And if everything runs smoothly, then maybe my fears will be allayed and I'm, I will, will not be sitting in this chair again. But um, sadly, my past experience was that um, I sat and listened to all, all the, 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 you know, the promises made and it was all going to be wonderful, etc, etc, etc. And it wasn't. And people lost their lives. Even this committee, I'm sorry to have to say this, but my wife and I sat in front of this committee. We gave you over 100 pages of, of, of information. We provided physical evidence of what was going on site and we were completely ignored and four people died. And that's my principal reason for being here. The sanctity of life is more important than a music festival. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bra Councillor Braun, please. I see the microphones are playing up just as usual. Can't uh, convene it. Um, yes, thanks. I just wanted to follow on from uh, Councillor McPherson's question, if I may. And, um, and thank you, Mr. Lydia, for your, your deputation. <clears throat> I'm, I'm looking at your letter, which you, you sent through, uh, and obviously your opposition to the camping element, uh, which implies it's, it's because of the tragic, tragic history of the site. And then further in your letter, you talk about the tragic history, presumably it's the five deaths that you mentioned. 
But you go on to say that that was you, they imply that it's drug use was the cause of the of the death there. I'm, I'm not sure if it was or not, but I'm, I'm trying to correlate overnight camping to drug use. That you, you you seem to be tying the two things together. That overnight camping will result in drug deaths, and I'm not I'm not sure if you could give a bit more explanation of how that comes together. Certainly during the, during the night hours, the music's finished and people go back to their tents and they, they've had the, you know, an exciting day and they want that to continue. And and therefore somebody says, oh, take one of these. Um, you know, it'll, you'll be able to carry on party until three o'clock in the morning. Um, you know, the, the, the campsite is the obvious place where that kind of behavior is going to happen. And indeed with Tea in the Park, we watched the people climbing in and out over the fences with their bags of drugs to sell on the campsite. That's why. Because because the campsite is somehow seen to be sort of out with the main event, um, and therefore secure the security element is perhaps not as tight as it should be. Still, Dad, if you saw people climbing over fences with drugs, did you contact the police? Well, absolutely, we were in constant in constant contact with the police, but unfortunately. Um, Right from the start, we were told by the police that security for an event of this nature is in the hands of the event organizer, not the hands of the police. The police are only there to deal with the ultimate ramifications. They are not there to deal with prevention. And unfortunately, my again, my wife and I spent a considerable amount of time with the, the site manager, not the site manager for year one, who was removed from his post, who is Mr. Govan's contact, but the new site manager. And we we went with the basis of our knowledge and the basis of what we've been told by police, we, in police and security people we've talked to. Here is a list of things you need to do. And they did none of them. And when I asked, why did you not even try to implement any of what we uh, suggested? They said, we're not prepared to spend the money. Um, if you could pardon the corner with the mic. Uh, if there are no further questions for Mr. Lydiard, uh, could I invite Mr. and Mrs. Collins to provide details of their objection, please? Uh, yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, first of all, I would say that um, we would agree with Mr. Lydiard, about the lack of notification with the licensing application, that was a source of concern to us. And it is a continuing source of concern because this um, application that is now being considered is limited to the objections that were written for the 2023 festival. And as I understand it, this application will be for 24, 25 and 26. Mr. Govan has spoken about um, all the considerations he's taken into account and the different plans he's made, the security, the traffic management. And yet, as a member of the public, we haven't been given any information about that, nor any opportunity to comment on it, because we are restricted to what we have commented on to do with the 2023 festival. It would appear to us that um, there is an expansion in some of the infrastructure for the 24 festival. And uh, again, we aren't allowed to comment on any of that. We do know from what Mr. Govan said himself that part of the plan for moving to Strathallan was not only the ability to enjoy the countryside, which to us seems odd to have a music festival in it, but also to expand it and that he was pleased at the number of bands that had applied um, since um, they'd moved to Strathallan. So the intention would appear to be to expand this festival. This is one of our greatest concerns. And we would respectfully ask that whatever license, if any, is granted, that it should only be for a year 
to address some of the issues that we're concerned about. Nobody has actually mentioned the number of hours of amplified music that this um, festival is going to generate. We totted it up to, I think it was about 41 hours in total that the neighborhood would be subjected to. And in the um, statements that were made were that the level of music would be lowered at, I believe, 11 p.m. to a neighbor-friendly level, which tells me that prior to that, it's not very friendly to the neighbors and would be quite disturbing to us and to the wildlife, if there is any left, on the Strathallan estate. So um, I understand, I think, that the permission applied for was for the music to continue until 1 a.m., which gives us pause to consider what is going to happen with regard to the traffic that is going to be leaving after 1 a.m. When I spoke to Mr. Govan about this, he did say to me that um, nobody would be leaving that late because they would be coming from Glasgow and they'd all want to leave earlier than that. He can't guarantee that. He doesn't know where they're actually going to be coming from. So there is every likelihood that if the music is allowed to continue till 1 a.m., there will be traffic on the roads from 2 a.m. probably until 3 a.m. This is a rural area um, that's August, particularly it's very heavy with sort of tractors and farming going on. The farmers are up on the roads with their tractors at half past four or five o'clock in the morning during this time. So that gives us very little chance to get any sleep at all if we're going to be kept awake, A, with the music, B, with the traffic, and then woken up by the farmers getting on with their normal lives. So we would like the committee to consider these hours and ask for them to be reduced. There is a precedent for this. Even Glastonbury has a curfew. I believe it's half past 11. So we would ask that the hours should not be um, permitted to continue until 1 a.m., but should be stopped, the amplified music should be stopped at 11 or 11.30 p.m. to allow us to get some sleep. Because the staging that this charity has will not be as robust as tea in the park, acoustic-wise. It will not contain the sound. It will travel over the countryside. And there are, I believe, four stages, one of which is completely open air. The other three, I think I understand from the website now, are in tents. The tent is not adequate to contain amplified music. So we would ask the um, committee to consider these hours in deciding any license. We're also disturbed that unlike tea in the park, there has been no environmental impact assessment. Presumably somebody has thought, well, we did that for tea in the park. We know what it's like, so we don't need to do it again. But I believe there should be another assessment done. Also, I think the infrastructure Mr. Govan himself talked about that is available to them is there because Tea in the Park received planning permission for that infrastructure, for that festival only. That planning permission has now expired. That infrastructure should have been removed and has not been. It should not be available to another festival to come along and make use of without any planning permission or any by your leave. They didn't um, remove it, even though there was an enforcement order on, because it was put down before tea in the park ever applied for planning permission. All the infrastructure was put in place before that happened. 
we don't like to see the way these things are managed without proper authority, almost, um, I wouldn't say by by the back door, it isn't a sort of underhand way, but it just does not seem right. It doesn't seem right that we're considering this license without another notification because the wider population is now more aware of this festival coming. But they're being given no opportunity to comment on this license application because you're using the application that was submitted for the cancellation of 2023. The committee meeting was cancelled, the festival was cancelled, it was not postponed. When you have an annual festival, it's not postponed, it's cancelled. 2023 was cancelled. If uh, Mugstock wished to apply for a licence for 24, 25 and 26, they should put out the notification again and the system should start from the beginning so that the public have an opportunity of studying any new developments, designs, extra infrastructure, anything new that's been added, we should be allowed to know about and we should be allowed to consider and comment on, not just those of us who've already objected, but those of us who didn't know anything about it before because as Mr. Liscard said, not many people knew because of the way this license application was dealt with. I think I've covered more or less everything that I want to say. I'm not sure if my husband wants no, no, to no. add anything. Basically, that's um, what we wanted to say. So the main point is the, the uh, amplified music and the hours on which it goes and obviously the administration of the whole process seems to have been somewhat cavalier and uh, we would like to have seen the process started again so that we could make adequate representation of what is now being considered to take place next July or August and um, we haven't and anybody else hasn't got that opportunity so to do. So thank you for listening to us. I hope we've explained everything adequately. Thank you, Mrs. Collings. Are you okay to answer any questions from members? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, do members have any questions for Mr. and Mrs. Collings? Councillor Harvey. Uh, hi, Mr. and Mrs. Collins. Thanks for your uh, presentation. Just one quick question. How far away do you stay very roughly from the, uh, the site, the proposed site of this festival? Thanks very much. Today, as the crow flies, Listen. about half a mile. No, less than that. Less Between than quarter that. and half a mile. Yeah. Put it this way, we can hear the tannoy for the horse riding that takes place on the same venue. Okay, thanks. Are there any further questions for Mrs. Collings? Therefore, I'll move add, to... Sorry, it, may I just say, just thinking when you are asking where we are, we should add that our house is on the junction through which all the traffic will come when they leave the festival at night. Welcome. Because even if they exit via the airfield, they will come up through Tully Barden to access the A9 to go back to Glasgow. So all the traffic that is leaving the festival after 1am will come through our junction and our bedroom is a mare 12 feet away from the road. Thank you, Mrs Collings. Um, I'm now going to ask uh, if members have any questions for the safety advisory group or the safety advisory group would like to comment on any of the concerns that have been raised. Okay, Robert Lyle. Thanks, convener. Um, I've got uh, a few notes here. Uh, the first one is regarding um, the presence of dogs. Um, it's unusual to have dogs at a festival. Certainly, it would be the first festival in Perth and Kim Ross that's actually had dogs present at it. I'm mindful that a festival is noisy, crowded, and has people that are drinking alcohol. 
it's it's not really a, a considered well i wouldn't consider it to be a dog friendly environment um it also presents then an additional security issue for for stewarding now we've heard that there's 38 stewards going to be present and uh, I think what we should be looking for for that predicted 4,000 people is does the security provider know that there may be dogs? And are the secure providers able to deal with potential dog attacks, either dog on dog or dog on human? The second thing is that the um, this festival is actually 5% of the footprint of the, the last festival that was on that site to put a bit of context on it. Regarding double skin fences, uh, double skin fences are used in a lot of festivals, but those are generally, um, no offence, the top of the range um, uh, festivals, you know, the ones that actually contain A-listers and that there's actually some merit to uh, kids actually trying to breach those fences. That's why they have double skins on them. Generally, it's actually a single panel Harris fencing with a screen on it. And that this is standard practice. And I would imagine that that's going to be the same thing here, although um, Mr. Govan can confirm that. Uh, selling tickets before you get a license is actually a common practice in the industry uh, because quite often the uh, the tickets for, for events actually will go up to, and Mr. Govan will be able to talk to this, I would imagine, um, uh, will go up for sale well in advance of uh, a year before before the, the event takes place. Um, rather than actually wait for the decision of a licensing committee, um, the, the tickets generally go on sale and you normally find in small print on adverts uh, subject to licensing provision uh, um, permissions, but generally in small print. Um, water safety. Um, uh, according to the plans, the, the stewards will have uh, through lines and there will be people watching the water the medical provisions is uh, the plans are to the satisfaction of the Scottish Ambulance Service and NHS Tayside Resilience. And the, the toilets are scaled at uh, one per 100, and that's based on the event safety guide. That's the, pur the purple guide. Uh, music noise, the, the, there's always some apprehension when it's a, a, a new event that's coming to town. But the plan, um, the, the plan um, uh, is in place. There are no concerns pre 11 p.m. But we, we need to iron out, we'll keep a closer eye on what happens post 11 p.m. Uh, to assist us with that, there will be uh, checks, sound checks carried out from the Thursday uh, prior to the event. Uh, to establish what the, the music levels are going to be like and also to iron out what the, the level should be uh, after 11 p.m. And regulated services will be in attendance throughout the event, along with uh, police colleagues um, uh, to actually sort of check on any of these conditions and compliance with the conditions. And those conditions, I think, are noted in the 64 decibels and 45 after 11 p.m. Those are just some of the observations, convener, that I made just from the, from the statements that both had made. Could I bring in Julie Mackay from the NHS, please, to comment on uh, this um, health and not the health and safety, but the, the health of people and the provision for um, monitoring the health, please? Hi there. Um, it's not really something that I'm able to comment on today. Um, I don't actually have the full information to look at for this event. OK, thank you, Julie. Are there any uh, questions for the members of the CPA advisory group from members? Uh, Councillor Stewart, please. Um, can I ask, um, is this Obviously, you, you're saying you're not. Uh, you don't have any information. Is that because it's not been provided or it's not been asked for? Thank you. Hi there. It's just something that I've not read up on at the moment. Thank you. Are there any further questions from members of the safety advisory group? 
uh, Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Convener. It's probably a, a comment rather than a question, but uh, you said about dogs and festivals. I've been to a couple of festivals, not in Perth and Canoes, that have had them, doing the rabbit hole being the most recent one, and they had a very comprehensive plan, so it might be worth kind of examining that because I think it's becoming more common nowadays. Thanks. Um. Do we have a representative from Police Scotland to comment on this event? James, are you there? Yes. Yeah, good afternoon, convener, um, committee members. Uh, yeah, Police Scotland um, submitted uh, no police objections on the basis that um, we would respectfully request that the drafted conditions are attached to any license that is granted. Um, there is ongoing discussions with the security provider and the applicant in terms of the policing plan for this event and uh, the discussions are still ongoing um, to agree them. Are there any questions? Members? No questions. Online? No questions? Nope. OK, could I now invite, please, Mr Lydiard to sum up, please? Um, well, I suppose my main comment is rather sort of um, matches that of the, the, the Collins, which is um, Unfortunately, there's an awful lot that already seems to have been decided or gone through, um, and yet none of those details have been provided for people like myself to even see or comment on. Um, and as sadly, I, I, I fear that um, rather like tea in the park, I'm sitting here thinking it's a done deal. Um, and as I've said in my letter, um, you are the committee who make the decisions, um, make your decision, but please, enough people have died at these events. Um, I don't want any more fatalities um, so that on a daily basis when I do walk my dog, I go, yeah, yes, that's where Peter died or that's where Megan died. Um, I th as I said right at the beginning, the entire process by which Tea in the Park got permission was one of lies and deceit from all those concerned the landowners, the Scottish Government, Perth and Kinross Council, and and again, as the Colin said, that infrastructure probably should have been removed, but it's still there, and this is the result. Um, but thank you for your kind attention, and you are the people who make the decision. Good luck to you. Thank you, Mr Lydiard. Um, could I therefore mis invite Mr and Mrs Collings to sum up, please? Hello, can you hear us? Yes, we can hear you. All right, technology's taken over. Um, I'm sorry, I went away for a, a break. My husband has been listening, so hopefully he can answer whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just carry on. We're just summarising. Yes, I, I, I agree with Mr. Lineard. Um, and basically, our fears are such that there does seem to be a done deal. There's bits and bobs that are made in the background, which could be a advantage to our objections, but um, they're still unsettled and um, particularly the noise and the traffic uh, and uh, we just feel that there isn't an adequate uh, presentation to the public to allow us to comment fairly one way or the other um, before this thing is decided and we would strongly ask that this is limited to one year um, so that uh, essentially the thing can be ironed out and in the future uh, we can either not have any objections or they can be more um, forcefully put forward. Thank you for your efforts. OK, thank you, Mr Collins. Um, could I therefore invite Mr Govan to respond to the objections and to sum up why he thinks a licence should be granted? Thank you very much. Um, OK, I'll, I'll no, no particular order. I've taken some notes and if, if there's points that I haven't covered, I'm, I'm glad to uh, to address them. Um, 
So thanks everyone for confirming that selling tickets before a license is entirely normal. If if that wasn't normal practice, almost no events would happen ever because the standard practice of license is often handed over on the very day of the event or the day before, normally after uh, completion of uh, Section 89 checks to ensure that the um, you know raised structures are safe. Obviously, that is one of the things we we know and we will do and happens in, in due course. And I'm sure it will be one of the conditions attached to license, which would be perfectly normal. Um, dogs uh, are invited not to, to boost ticket sales, but uh, essentially um, because a lot of people consider dogs to be a member of the family. It's a family festival and in our experience, dogs have enhanced the atmosphere of the festival um, by their presence. But we take the you know the not ungrounded concerns uh, very seriously. Um, we, we know that if a dog uh, escapes, if a dog to escape and to kill a sheep on site, that could be us losing our entire site. We do not take this lightly and we um, I think we're you know, broadly on the on the same page. Um, I would like to apologise for my you know, use of the word hiccup um, in um, regard to or euphemistically referring to the previous years. Uh, in my mind, what I was referring to in that point was the effects on neighbours and certainly not the uh, the the deaths on site. I, obviously, I cannot really comment or take responsibility for um, such tragedy occurring at a different event. And I think that it's maybe unfair to assume that the the, the factor, the main factor, uh, at play there was the physical location rather than the nature of the event, the established reputation of the event and I think the normalcy uh, and how, how normalised perhaps um, the the maybe the behaviours and um, cultures that, that evolved uh, in Tea in the Park over its many years um, maybe had uh, more to, to bear on that but I, I say I apologies for any any offence caused, I do not want to in any way uh, minimise um, or underplay the, the, the seriousness of um, what has happened uh, previously. Um, the toilets are, yeah, they're in line with the purple guide. Um, currently, we have provision for 43 port loos five six bay urinals and six accessible port loos plus at least 10 additional for uh, backstage areas and crew. The campsites will be secured by uh, fencing and also by um, security who will be on patrol. But I would emphasise our main security, our, well, our main security, our security policy starts with the way we book and market the festival, uh, right down to the explicit intentional choice of the tag, um, the, the tag phrase, a festival of music and merriment. It is designed to sound intentionally twee and massively off-putting to the type of people who might come and may um not engage in the festival in the way in which we would hope our festival goers are going to engage the i i went to tea in the park as an 18 year old i'm 41 now and um i think probably um, myself and the objectors have more in common in terms of our um views on uh, on tea in the park than when we may have uh, uh differences uh the one of the primary reasons for this event being established was to provide an alternative, a palpable alternative where people do feel safe um, and tragedy does not occur while people get together and have a really nice time together. Um, so um, you know, everything we do from who we book, um, we, we do not book the type of acts that people will bother to jump fences to get into. And if they do, we have a wristband system, we have security, we have patrol, um, but I, I, we ought, we, um, benefit perhaps from the rural location that it's not an easy place for people to to walk to um obviously we're discouraging that within our traffic management plans we everyone buying a ticket it accepts a disclaimer to say that they will um travel responsibly which includes not walking not cycling paying attention to speed restrictions which will be put in in um, form of a traffic order um amplified music so comparable events that uh, there may be some of the um that you know, other events that, that Council Harvey has, has been to, they will often go to uh, 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m. in the case of uh, Kelburn Garden Party, which has a larger capacity, uh, is nearer, uh, um, considerably nearer, a larger um, population um, in Largs. Um, and and they, but within, I think, just to, to be aware of the context in which we're operating, that it is not relatively normal for events like this to go on as late as that. Uh, so for 1 a.m. Um, for for three nights and uh, of the year, in fact, it's two nights because we will finish at midnight on Sunday with amplified music. Um, so I think, um, yeah, we, we, we asked the, to 
to, to consider that as, as a proportional. And uh, uh, if you imagine that at exactly the same time as we shut down and switch off our music, there's probably establishments with licenses in some of the um, uh, urban areas that are going to go till 3 a.m. And it's quite normal for people to expect to go and enjoy themselves on those sorts of timescales in this country. Um, However, in order to mitigate, because we're very aware that the you know the noise impacts can um, you know can cause concern, and and these concerns are very rightly taken very seriously by licensing committees, um, we have planned our noise our noise management right down to the the the, the site layout and the orientation of stages. We have. Um, um, measure the distance from nearby residences. We know where the main sort of populations are, and essentially, what's the, the, most of the you know the nearby population is to the south. We do not have any uh, sound pointing towards the south. Um, Mrs. Collins pointed out that uh, that that sound will often travel quite far. Uh, I would be a bit more exact and say that treble, the higher range of sound, travels um in a in a direction it travels the direction base is is omnidirectional it will go uh, in each direction so we we take both into account um we are pointing the stages away uh, to, to every possible way away from people's um abodes um which um, including um splizzards um Osprey was mentioned. Um, we've taken the advice um, of the the landowner, who obviously for that for, for whom it's been a you know a, a series of ongoing um, issue um, of concern, and we understand the main issues in terms of time scales, where that the tea in the park, it being such a large event, and maybe this also addresses or would be my my response to the issues such as silt causing issues to the waterway is comes back to the scale of the event and the amount of traffic, the amount of footfall, the amount of infrastructure, the amount of uh, work that takes place on, on the land. And I know that um, when I met Mr. Um, Scollins at their at their home, I, I I understood palpably that they had a you know a, a really intense experience, mainly caused by the the build and break traffic, and they described just wall to wall trucks going back and forward. Um, Mrs. Collins raised a concern that perhaps the infrastructure was going to be enhanced uh, compared to what we had uh, shared in terms of plans. It hasn't. Uh, there's no intention to do anything bigger. There is a very realistic possibility we will downscale, but there is no chance whatsoever of us upscaling or bringing anything more onto the site than we we'd already intended. In terms of neighbouring uh, and neighbourly relations, uh, I apologise that we haven't got rounds and knocked the doors and handed in copies of these plans. Um, the, and I will address the, um, the, the site notices as well. Um, but in this, um, the, you know, in the, the immediate sort of instance, um, we we had to expedite plans quite considerably, and this is because of the licensing process whereby this three year license that we put in, uh, it's obviously within our interests as an organization, as a pro, as a charity to um, to capitalize on that. We've paid a, you know, a not inconsiderable license application fee and we were very pleased with our colleagues uh, at the council. We're happy to um, to confirm that the policy is that that three year license comes into play when it is granted. But there is a strict nine months in which that license has to be considered. So it's being considered at this meeting, as I understand, because we're not sure whether there would be a meeting in uh, November or January. And the, the, the day that that time limit runs out, as I understand, it, is the 1st of February. So that's why we had to um, do, do a lot of work at short period, uh, short notice to um, to update plans, to to take on board uh, feedback we'd received, particularly around traffic management uh, and uh, if we'd had, you know, if we had another another couple of weeks to do that, um, we'd have found the time to go up and 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 share that with the neighbours. But I um, would emphasise that uh, one of the reasons maybe that it felt, you know, okay to not have done so is that we haven't changed anything other than changes that are likely to be an improvement to uh, to how the the event is received and the impacts on the community. Uh, one example of that, so Mrs. Collins mentioned that the traffic will depart, uh, departing traffic will go past that junction. Uh, it will not anymore. So in the new traffic management plan, uh, the traffic will exit by the, the airfield exit and uh, it, will, it, will, it will turn left. They will go down, uh, unfortunately these roads are not named, so I just have to go. They will turn right onto a thin uh, road, which will be one way. And then from there, they'll be directed um, south down to the, uh, the green loaning 
uh, sorry, not the, the, um, the junction at, at Glen Eagles, which is double graded and therefore allows all, all traffic, rather than going north or south on the A9, to turn without without having to turn onto the A9, essentially. Um, so we will update. I think we've got our um, website, um, which I say all the neighbours have had details of, um, and that is at www.mugs.org forward slash neighbours. Uh, we will continue to to add details. Again, my thought of a logical order of work was to uh, get the approval of the officers of the SAG, um, the SAG approval from the committee and share the plans um, as as have been ratified and agreed. So um, we will we will do that. Um, the security uh, provision uh, that we've got in place, it's, it's comparable um, just in terms of um, numbers, in terms of uh, cost to um, the the same um, up to, to the security at Lindisfarne Festival. Lindisfarne Festival is a Northumbrian festival uh, with camping. Uh, they describe themselves as a weekend of hedonism. Um, so quite different in terms of what they're going for uh, and they're 18 plus and they are a weekend camping festival and we're paying roughly the same amount to the same company for uh, our security provision. Essentially, it, it could be argued that it is over the top for the demographic that we expect, but um, essentially better safe than sorry. Um, we, you know, we don't intend to, you know, to expand within the terms of this three year license. We can't expand without applying for a new license. So hopefully that reassures on that point. Um, medical provision has been covered. I did bring up the uh, details. So there will be one medical manager, eight first aid responders, two IHCD paramedics, um, include uh, crews, both including two IHCD technicians and two emergency ambulances. Um, and that, I think, is what I have noted uh, at the moment. Hopefully that is helpful. So just to, to summarise, the site note, I was going to mention the site notes. Yes, yeah, so apologies that that was not uh, as smooth as it uh, as it could have been. We uh, initially, you know, in the guidance, it was said to display at the entrance to the site. Now, in my um, estimations, what, where we put the, there might seem like a, a strange phase out of context, where we put the first site notice was the entrance to the site as it will as it will be in terms of the site plan. So this is the main field right in front of the castle uh, and we, we put it there. It was very rightly pointed out and I'm glad it did come to your attention. Obviously someone saw it and, and let you know um, that uh, that was insufficient and we really we should try and put on on both the other <laughs> entrances. So we uh, we did so, we did so very quickly. Um, and then when it came to the market operator's license, which we uh, we were unaware that a market operator's license would be required, it wasn't something that we were asked to uh, provide by the previous local authority we worked with, Stirling Council, they, it all just came under a public entertainment license to include the stalls and concessions. So that one blindsided us a little bit. We pulled that together and uh, I thought it wasn't myself that went up to put those notices. It was my girlfriend and I asked her to do that because she was already in, uh, she was in Creef delivering uh, community engagement workshops. Um, she's going to be the, the head of decor. So they were, she was up there helping kids make octopuses out of recycled bottles. And because she was there, I asked her, could you put these up? And I thought I'd said enough to, to, uh, for, to remember to put it up at both, but she neglected to put it up at the, uh, the airfield entrance. And so we went and we addressed that a couple of days later. And hopefully you, you saw them there. That, that really was not an uh, intention to be um, to be sneaky, um, uh, it was simply a, um, a symptom of not being uh, completely thorough enough in that in that first instance. Um, but I can totally appreciate how that may have come across. Um, but uh, clearly, in the fact that these you know, has has reached your you know your attention, and we were able to get the objections. Um, hopefully, hopefully, no harm done. And I think, yeah, and I, I would say that whilst we didn't, you know, say that there were concerns about how those notices were put up within that that, that time scale at that same time and uh, in advance of the uh, the window, the first window of opportunity to launch an objection. Uh, I did personally knock on every door uh, of, uh, I think it was um, uh, 
Uh, I think we, we thought I think they said 80, but that was in, that was under the belief that the 20 or so lodges at Tully Barden were occupied. They're, they're not. So it ended up being 76 or something houses, uh, all of which are being offered um, free tickets to the event for their entire household. And they were all provided with information, um, including the times they anticipated times of operation and the times of amplified music. Um, so that's it, that, that was provided and I can confirm I put that through. Uh, I, I did not get Mr Lydiard in at home, but I did put it personally through his door and it had that information on the letter. And why we should be granted a license, uh, I'd say we're coming uh, sincerely as a, um, as a group, as a charity, as an organisation that, uh, that believes that there's value and virtue in people gathering um, and being able to form a, you know, a small collective community for a weekend which is really focused on celebrating uh, the, you know, the, the talent that is there, celebrating the great outdoors, um, being away from it all <laughs> for want of a better um, uh, expression um, and uh, and we're grateful for, for everyone who's, um, who's challenged us to ensure that we approach this uh, to do it as safely as can uh, as possible um, and uh, and yeah hopefully we uh, we will together put on a, you know, a memorable event that will be very beneficial to Perth and Ken Ross um, for uh, for years to come and I really hope that uh, that the, say the locals who have been I'd say on the whole incredibly supportive uh, of the event and we've, we've had this fed through from our um, and partners at uh, the local community council um, and from those you know, whose, whose doors we've knocked, some had already sort of um, signed up to volunteer and they're enthusiastic. Um, the, I, I will maybe address one more point as I remember the, the concern about volunteers um, uh, essentially signing up and then neglecting their duties and that is a, an issue that the festivals um, experience but I'd say it's more often a issue experienced by larger, more commercial festivals with larger acts because people are saying in the same way as if M&M's playing, you might go, oh, maybe I'll jump the fence. Oh, I haven't got enough money. I'll maybe get, I'll maybe say I'm going to volunteer and then not. That temptation, I would say, is vastly, vastly reduced. If you're interested enough in Mugstock, you probably understand it. You probably appreciate the community aspect of it. And uh, you, and if you are going to volunteer, you're doing it for, um, because you're volunteering not for a company, you're volunteering for a charity. And we've got a fantastic volunteer coordinator who makes everyone feeling truly welcome, monitors everyone very carefully and closely. And what you also find, if in the very, very few occasions where someone uh, either doesn't show for a shift or can't show for a shift because obviously people get ill in the same way as contractors might, but a volunteer might. Uh, what you find is that because it is this community feel, there'll be volunteers that will go above and beyond and get involved and roll up their sleeves and, uh, and and make it all happen. So, and that's one of the advantages of, sort of operating as this, the community that, that we do. So yeah, I hope, um, I hope I've made a sufficient case to respect the, the views and the decision of the panel. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Um, do members wish to adjourn for a uh, discussion? Yes. OK, we're going to leave the chamber for a few moments and, and sort our decision. Um, so uh, members, if you can rejoin us in the uh, pre-meeting room. Uh, thank you everybody for your patience. Um, as you can tell, we've had a bit of a discussion. My motion is to uh, grant the license uh, subject to the conditions which are in Appendix 2. Um, do I have a seconder? Um, I'll second. Are there any amendments to the motion? Councillor Anderson. We've got two amendments. Uh, either Councillor Anderson or. OK, Councillor uh, Braun, go first. OK, thank you, uh, convener. Yes, um, listen to this very intently. I think there's a lot of points put across. Um, um, my thoughts are that. Given the objectors points and I, 
I think the valid point was that to give us a trial for one year. So my amendment effectively is uh, that the license be granted for one year only uh, to be reviewed after that date, but adopting Appendix 2 as is. Um, so it's a simple amendment, um, uh, Appendix 2 as it is, but li literally a one year license. And I don't know if there's a seconder for that, please. I'd be happy to second that amendment. Uh, thank you, Billy Brock. Um, Councillor Anderson. I just want to move that dogs are specifically excluded from the festival throughout the period of it. Um, there's all the confusion of dogs, which is dangerous dogs, all the multitude of things that could arise and be questioned, type of bring allowed certain breeds in and restricted. I think it could be much safer at the time of year, everything else. The so dogs are specifically excluded from the the festival, that be the camping element, plus you know the whole event. Do you have a second, to Councillor Anderson? Is there a seconder for Councillor Anderson's uh, amendment? I'm afraid there's no seconder for you for your, for amendment, Councillor Anderson. Could I now hand over to the clerk to carry out a, a roll call vote, please? Thank you, convener. We have an amendment from your, sorry, a motion from yourself to grant the licence as per the conditions contained in Appendix 2, seconded by Councillor McPherson. We have an amendment from Councillor Braun to grant for a one year period only with the conditions as detailed in Appendix 2, and that's seconded by Bailey Brock. Members, when I call your name, if you let me know if you're voting for the motion or the amendment. Councillor Anderson. Amendment. Councillor Braun. Amendment. Bailey Brock. Amendment. Councillor Frampton. Amendment. Councillor Harvey. Motion. Councillor McPherson. Motion. Councillor Robertson. Motion. Councillor Stewart. Motion. And Bailey Williamson. Motion. Thank you. I have five votes for the motion and four for the amendment. Therefore, the motion will carry. Thank you. Thank you. No, we move on to market operator market operators license, which I think she as well, isn't it? Do you wish to pause for a comfort break? Or do you just want to carry on? I think a comfort break would be ideal, uh, convener. Thank. And I'm just listening to someone. How long is your parking ticket for? My goodness. Right, we're cutting this fine. OK, well, let's let's go for this. OK, let's go for this then. OK. Let's go for it then. OK, members, this application is page 51 onwards from your document pack for this item of business. We are joined in the chambers by the applicant, Mr. Ongoven, and the objector, Mr. Lydiard. I invite Mr. Lydiard to provide details of his objection. Thank you, Councillor. My specific objection. Now, I mean, to be fair, I didn't realise that this was a, an application for up to 50 traders. Um, but obviously, I understand that a festival of this nature, you know, it needs to have people selling things. And therefore, my particular objection, seemingly in line with national thinking, is that absolutely no vaping material should be on sale at all. That is my objection. Thank you, Mr. Lydiard. Do members have any questions for Mr. Lydiard? If the line, nope, there are no questions for you, so you go off light. Um, could I invite Mr. Govan, Govan to speak to his application and respond to the objection, please? Yeah, absolutely. So the so the application is um, in association with the festival. There's no plan to run a market um, on the, those grounds out with the uh, the festival. Uh, I would say it's a matter of um, uh, among uh, 
probably most paramount is a matter of welfare that if we do not have a license then we cannot have anyone selling food and um, we'll have a lot of hungry people and probably a lot of uh, issues surrounding that and um, so uh, i would ask the uh, the sort of common sense approach would be to um to apply the license if you're if you agree that we can invite lots of people to a place so that they can um some of them will stay overnight that they have the option to to buy things um i um we have a, a a single use plastic policy and I think that well, probably what the objector is referring to in terms of uh, the vaping materials is the uh, the prevalence of single use vapes that um, I say as a um, as an individual I would say is quite an abhorrent practice that there's things being sold that, that technically you can't dispose of safely um, because you um, of the types of batteries in them etc. Um, I have no problem at all with saying that single use vapes will not be on sale at the site i would totally agree with that that's absolutely fine um and uh, in terms of up to 50 there, there won't be i think we put that in um uh, as a sort of absolute maximum uh, giving ourselves plenty of flexibility i think there's likely to be somewhere in the region of 16 traders um on site um, about six or seven of which will be selling food uh, and there will be three three bars uh, on site as well they'll be run by uh, by gurleys of grief thank you mr Gowan. Uh, do members have any questions for mr govan as lahavi so you said single use vapes uh, is that does that include all vapes then you think or say or wouldn't there might be a chance um, the only sort of uh, alternative to that is that you might find that one of the traders decides to sell a very good reusable vaping product that doesn't have the same environmental concerns attached to it. In which case, uh, I probably wouldn't have a you know a major objection to that as a festival. Um, but um, so it's, if, if there was such a strong feeling around that matter from uh, from council, then we would we would take your uh, yeah, your advice on that. OK, thanks. Councillor Stewart. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Councillor Harvey asked my question. Thank you. Are there any further questions for Mr. Cummins? No questions? Uh, Convener, yeah, sorry. I was, I was just I'm, gonna, I'm, yeah, sorry. I was just going to go online there, Bob. I'm sorry, I do apologise. Go over to you, Bob. Yeah, just a very quick clarification for Mr. Govan. Uh, are there any tobacco products going to be on sale? You talk about vapes, but over the widest period, is anybody else going to be selling any tobacco products? Um, yeah, probably uh, probably one uh, outlet would uh, sell uh, a limited range of tobacco products. OK, Bob. That's fine. I've got a question for officers, but a well, legal clarification, but I'll wait for when that, we get to that point. OK, thank you. Councillor Braun, can you hear us? I can now, yes. <laughs> OK, a question for officers. Yes, it was just a very quick question on um, tobacco licensing. Do, does a, a person need to be licensed for selling vapes and tobacco products or registered some way? I know shops do, but I'm not sure about vapes where they have to be uh, registered. As it's I don't sell them. Out with the licensing regime. It's out with that, is it? Yes, Councillor Brown. OK, fine. Thank you very much. Thanks. I do apologise. Are you saying licensing favourites aren't, 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 aren't licensed? Sorry, we don't license vapes within the license department. I don't know if trading it falls under trading standards remit. I'm not sure, but certainly from the vaping side, it doesn't or tobacco doesn't fall under uh, our particular remit. Bob, did you get that? Yes. Yep. Can we heard that fine? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm trying to rush through for Mr. Lydiard's benefit here. Um, 
Are there any further questions for uh, officers? There are no further questions. Could I ask Mr. Liard if he could sum up, please? I was going to include alcohol, but um, I'm assuming I'm assuming that also is just going to be passed through. So no further questions. Thank you. I would suggest perhaps uh, alcohol. Um, yeah, just to say that um, we were we want to put an event on and it will be normal expectation of customers coming to the event will be the ability to um to buy souvenirs to buy uh food and drink um and uh um, so we hope to be able to provide that we've got um when we're quite experienced with this the operations manager works with us he started uh, as a as a festival trader among, among other things himself so I had a really good relationship with some of the traders that we've uh, worked with regularly and we're also um really quite pleased that quite a lot of local businesses have got involved um and uh, are, are coming to you know to help provide um their services and, and look after everyone um they also um as it was it was asked for the, the the sag in terms of our mental health uh, we've got that you know robust approach to that that where obviously they um, require uh, to, to sab every you know every trader, particularly the the food and drink traders, to be vetted and have appropriate paperwork submitted to show that they're gas safe and that they have had their units inspected and uh, are going to you know follow food hygiene and hand washing and 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 all of that good stuff. So obviously there'll be a process as we finalise um, who all those traders are of submitting all that paperwork so it can be scrutinised by the relevant officers. Thank you, Mr. Govan. Uh, do members wish to adjourn for a discussion? No. no. OK, no. I would like to move that we grant the application. Do I have a seconder? I'll second. Uh, either Councillor McPherson or Councillor Frampton. <laughs> Councillor Frampton, OK, thank you. Are there any amendments to the motion? If there are no amendments to the motion, the motion is carried. Thank you. Done. Could I suggest a five or ten, ten minute comfort break for everybody? Stretch your legs. <laughs>